Today's lesson is called Modeling Linear Relationships. So when we use equations to model real-world phenomena, we often first look to linear models because they are the easiest to use and understand. We can now utilize our skills from the last few lessons to model real-world linear situations. So don't ever forget these two facts about our linear models. All linear models in the form y equals mx plus b have two parameters, the slope and the y-intercept. So the slope is always going to tell us how fast the output is changing relative to the input. And the y-intercept always tells us how much we're starting with or the output starting value, which means that x equals zero. So we're going to go through three different situations and each time you're going to be given different information as a starting point. But we're still going to be answering the general kind of questions about what is being modeled with this linear relationship. So in situation one, you are given the slope and the y-intercept. Janine has $450 in her savings account at the beginning of the year. She places an additional $15 into her savings account at the end of each week. We want to model the amount of money she has in savings, S of W, as a function of the number of weeks she has been saving, W. So our variables are defined for us. A says, write an equation for the savings, S of W, as a linear function of the weeks she has been saving, W. So remember, slope and y-intercept. And we know from our lessons on writing the equation of the line, those are the two things that we need to write the equation. So looking at the description that we were given, the first thing I see is she has $450 in her account at the beginning of the year. So that's where we are starting. That means that's the y-intercept because that's what she's starting with. Then... I see she places an additional $15 in her account at the end of each week. So that's describing a rate of change, which means that this is giving us our slope. So now we have what we need to write our equation, our slope and our y-intercept. So S of W, remember, which is where we usually put Y, but we're using function notation. So S of W is equal to our rate of change or slope, which is $15 per week, right? W is for weeks, plus the $450 she had to start. So we were able to read that real world situation and pick out from the problem what we needed. So now we can answer very similar questions that we've always answered about linear models. So B, how much money will Janine have saved up after saving for 30 weeks. So when I see 30 weeks, that means W is equal to 30. And since we wrote our equation, which is why the equation is so important to write no matter what, we can use it to answer the question. So we're just finding S of 30. We're putting in an input of 30 weeks. So that would be 15 times 30, right? We're gonna place W with 30 plus the 450. So 15 times 30 is 450, plus 450 that was already there makes 900. So how much money will Janine have saved after, nine, uh, after saving for 30 weeks? Uh, she will have saved $900. In C, if she decides to save $10 more per week, so let's go in and highlight that, $10 more per week. Write an equation for the savings, S of W, as a linear function of the week she's been saving W. So she's saving $10 more per week. What's that affecting? That's affecting the rate at which she's saving. So it's an increase in our slope. Our slope was already 15. She's increasing it by $10 more which means now our slope is 25. So S of W is equal to 25W plus 450. There's no change in what she started with. So how long will it take Janine to save $900 now with her extra savings? So this time 
we know she's going to save $900. This is our output. So that means S of W is equal to 900. So we're going to replace the left-hand side of our equation with 900. And on the other side, we have 25W plus 450. We are going to solve for our input to see how many weeks it will take her. So we have to get W alone. Let's subtract 450 from both sides. So 450 equals 25W. And then we would divide by 25 to see that W is 18. So it will take her 18 weeks. And now you could do a kind of a direct comparison about what's happening now that she's saving more per week. And you notice that when we answer these questions, we're labeling them so that our answers are describing things that were in the original description. So let's move on to situation two. Situation two, we're given two points. So Lincoln is driving along a long road at a constant speed. Constant speed is implying a linear relationship. He is keeping track of how far he is from Denver. He knows that after two hours of driving, he is 272 miles from Denver. After three and a half hours, he is 176 miles from Denver. So in part A, it says summarize the information given in the problem as two ordered pairs, where the number of hours is H is the input and the distance from Denver, D of H, is the output. So you can see by the way that this real world problem was described, they're giving you two snapshots in time. And those snapshots are your coordinates. So the first one two hours of driving, 272 miles from Denver, is your first coordinate. And then after three and a half hours, he's 176 miles from Denver, is your second coordinate. So whenever the problem is structured like that, it's giving you two points that you can then use to answer questions. So our coordinates would be 2, 272, and 3.5176. So in part B, it says, assuming the relationship is linear, which it would be if it was a constant speed, we're going to write an equation for the distance D as a linear function of the number of hours H. So here, just make sure that we do D of H like we did before. Stay consistent there. Okay, so if we're going to write the equation, we know from our previous lessons that we have to find two things. We have to find the slope and the y-intercept. So we have to do that no matter what, and we have to use what we're given. So we were given two points. So we're going to use the slope formula then because we can label this x1 and y1 and x2 and y2. And then we can use our slope formula to find our slope. So m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Remember my suggestion, make your outline first so that you don't lose any of the signs. And then we'll plug in our information. So y2 is 176. y1 is 272. Then x2 is 3.5. And x1 is 2. So when we do this math, we get negative 96 over 1.5, which is negative 64. So now we know our slope is negative 64. Now, they did not give us the y-intercept. Sometimes they will. If they were to tell us where we started from, or if they would have told us what was an x value of 0, what the output was, we could use that information. We don't have that. So we have to find the y-intercept algebraically like we've done in the past. We'll use one of our points as our x and our y, and then we'll use our slope. We'll plug everything into y equals mx plus b and solve for b. So we've got y equals mx plus b. 
I'm going to use the first coordinate, 2 and 272. So my y value is 272. My slope is negative 64. My x value is 2 and plus b. We're solving for b. So we get 272 equals negative 64 times 2 is negative 128 plus b. And to get b alone, we would add 128 to both sides. So b equals 400. So now we have everything that we would need to write our equation. d of h is equal to our slope, which is negative 64. That's going to go in front of h with a y-intercept of 400. So this is our equation. And the last one, state the meaning of the slope and the y-intercept for this function with respect to the distance from Denver d of h and the number of hours h. So a lot of times in these real-world contexts, like I said, these numbers mean something. So we have to be able to describe what they mean. So the slope here is negative 64, and the y-intercept is 400. So what this is trying to tell us is that the starting distance to Denver is 400 miles. And the next thing we have to look at is the slope. It's a negative 64. That means it's decreasing. So the starting distance to Denver is, is 400 miles and the distance decreases because of the negative 64 miles per hour on the trip. Or some other wording close to that. The point being you're 400 miles away and after every hour passes, you are losing 64 miles, which means you're 64 miles closer to your destination because of the way that this problem was worded. And then we'll look at our last possible situation, which is you're given a graph. So we kind of had everything here. If you're given the graph, let's look at this new problem. A pump begins to fill a water storage tank when the volume drops to 225 gallons. The pump fills the tank at a steady rate, so there's that whole idea of constant rate in a linear model, for 150 minutes. After 60 minutes, there are 1,653 gallons in the storage tank as shown on the graph. So you've got a graph here. The first question says, what is the slope of this linear function? Now, Normally, when we have a graph, we can count rise over run. But if it's not a nice graph, rise over run's not your best method. There are no grid lines here. Our coordinates are not falling at nice spots, per se. They're halfway in between blocks. It's going to be difficult to count rise over run here. So it's better to take the two coordinates that were given and use the slope formula once again. So I will write my coordinates up here. We've got 0 and 225. And then we also have 60 and 1,653. So those two coordinates are going to give us our x1, our y1, our x2, and our y2. So where it says what is the slope, we can now calculate our slope using the formula. m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we'll do our outline so we don't mess up any of our numbers. Y2 is the 1,653 number. Y1 is 225. X2 is 60. And X1 is 0. So when we subtract, we get 1,428 over 60, which is 23.8. We would not have been able to find that by counting rise over run. Now, we found it, but it says using proper units, explain what this slope represents. That's what this is about. That number means something. So here, 
we were finding the slope. This is talking about the rate at which we're filling a tank. So we will say the tank fills 23.8. And we look back up and see that the measurement were gallons. So appropriate units would be gallons. The tank fills 23.8 gallons per and if we go back and take a look, everything was based on minutes, so per minute. So we found the rate of change or slope, but the other thing we have to do is describe it in context, and we've done that. So what will the volume be in the storage tank after 150 minutes? So we could try to look at the graph, but once again, if I go to look at the graph and I kind of follow up 150, it's hard to tell the exact spot. If we could use the graph and we could tell the exact spot, then we'd be done. But if we can't, remember, you can always find these things algebraically. So volume after 150 minutes, it would be really nice to have the equation. Remember, the equation allows you to find all these other things. So let's write the equation and then by using that, we'll be able to find the answer. So we have what we need to write the equation. You need the slope, which we already found, and we have the y-intercept. They gave it to us. It's on the graph. It's 0, 225. So my formula is V of T. That's what the graph is labeled over here, V, right? V of T equals my slope, which is 23.8 in front of the T, and then 225 as my y-intercept. So we want to find 150 minutes. That's input which means we want a T value of 150. So we're gonna find V of 150. 23.8, replace my T with 150. And then we do the math. The first calculation, 3,570. And when we add those together, we get 3,795. So again, appropriate units here. What even is that? So 150 minutes gave us, remember this is gallons, so 3,795 gallons. So this is all about modeling a linear relationship, having a real world context, finding all the things that we've always been finding about a linear function, but describing what they mean with our parameters of slope and y-intercept. And that concludes our lesson on modeling linear relationships.